When looking at a franchise, don't let what's in fashion cloud your judgment. Solid advice from Greg Moore, our guest in today's podcast. Greg is the founder of Franchise Maven, best-selling author, and serial entrepreneur. So join us for a candid conversation with Greg Moore. Hello, Greg. Uh, really nice to have you on the podcast. Um, to get us started, what, what do you feel are the key elements uh, for someone to have success in, in running a franchise? Well, William, the, the first thing that people have to have when they are starting to look at a franchise, there's a few qualities that people need to have. Uh, one, a little bit of risk tolerance. It's a business. You start it out, there's going to be a little bit of risk. So you got to have a little bit of risk tolerance. The other thing is, is that you have to be coachable. You're going to have a team of people that's going to help you grow and help that business grow, and they're going to coach you through it on that. So you've got to be coachable. And then the other one is you got to be able to follow processes and procedures. That's why you're getting into a franchise, because they've already got that process and procedure outlined for you. So you got to be able to follow those, be coachable, and be a little bit risk tolerant. You, you have been a, um, a franchisee. You have been a consultant. You have actually started off as an engineer. I, I guess that engineering uh, training helped you kind of uh, mold the franchise into a franchise? A little bit of everything, William. I actually got my career started off in, in the restaurant industry as a restaurant manager. So that's where I got good with working with people, not only teams of people, but then working with uh, customers and clients on a regular basis. And then when I got into the engineering field, uh, that got me into more of the analysis a point of view, uh, analyzing large amounts of data as well. And so I got my bachelor's degree in that. And then I received a master's degree in business and then, then helped me with my business acumen. So I was able to put that whole package together. And uh, as a restaurant manager or having been in the restaurant industry um, and having been able to... Um Put people in different territories, over 500 territories, according to the data. Uh, what what do you feel is the difference? You must have dealt with several different, all different kinds of concepts, be it uh, white collar service industry versus food service industry. Uh, what do you see as a as a comparison between the two? You know, well, it really comes down to what my people uh, feel good about on that. They're going to look at two aspects of it. One is, you know, what are they comfortable running? What do they feel good about running? And the other one, of course, is do the numbers make sense? It really doesn't matter from the number standpoint too terribly much whether you get into like the food service industry or any kind of like brick and mortar type franchise where you build a location, you build it and they will come. General theme on that, as opposed to the service industry where your clients don't necessarily know you exist until they need you. In that case, you need a great franchise system to drive people to you when that need arises. The businesses are just going to be run a little bit differently. With the brick and mortar, you put in a great A-plus location. A good franchise system is going to go out there and find that location for you and do the lease negotiations for you as well. But you just build it, create a good team of people, create good customer service. People drive by, they see you, they come into that business. That's what that business is all about. Service industry. You're going to have somebody, generally speaking, are going to be going out into uh, uh, and visit with people, whether it be business owners, whether it be consumers, there's business to business, business to consumers, either way. And you go out and people have already said, I've got a problem and you're going to be their superhero. You're going to solve their problem for whatever it is, whether it's senior care, tutoring, home services, uh, you know, helping them grow their business better on that. But you're going to go out there because they needed you. They want somebody to help them out. And so you go out there and you let them know what you do and how you're going to help these people solve their problems on that. So it's just a little bit different about uh, how you go about running that business. And it comes really down to my people and really what they feel good about running. And, and it also has to do with with uh, 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 several factors, that uh, monetary investment, whether they want to work full time, part time. Uh, you know, so th this is how you kind of qualify them into which sector they should go into, right? It's oh, exactly right, William. With the brick and mortar, obviously, since you've got a, a bigger place and you've got to build out that location, it's going to be a little bit more of an investment. You're looking at, you know, probably $300,000 on up. If you go with a standard 7A loan, you're going to be putting down about 20%. So you're going to be needing about, you know, about $60,000 for a down payment. You've got to build out. And it's going to be, you know, six, nine months down the road before that location gets built out on there. There. So that's a, that's a big investment. Whereas the service industry, you're probably looking at, you know, $150,000, give or take. Uh, a lot of them, you can work from home. Uh, that uh, 
or small office, but generally people don't just drive by and say, you know, oh yeah, I wanted to check that that plumbing franchise, that plumbing you know business out. Uh, they generally uh, they they call you, and then a great franchise system has a good uh, call center that will take care of those. But the big one there between the two is really the monetary investment on those brick and mortar is going to be quite a bit more uh, than your standard uh, service industry type franchise. And other than the monetary investment. Um, is there a point where you say, you know, you're not right for franchising? Have you have you come across that where you find someone that says, you know, this franchising is just not for you? It really, might do when when people get a little bit too uh, overanalyzing or too technical or find too many issues with that. It generally, that uh, what they're trying to say is that you know, it's just it's just not a good fit franchising in itself, and it's not. A franchising is not for everybody. I would say there's a franchise for everybody out there, but I wouldn't never ever say that fran that franchising is right for everybody out there. You do have to know that you know again you can be a little bit risk tolerant going into business for yourself. But there are some people. I would say my younger entrepreneurs are probably the toughest ones because they're really ready to go out there and they want to do something and try something for themselves by themselves without having a team for it. It's interesting though that my older entrepreneurs, I've had people that come to me and they you know, opened up, you know, and sold, you know, four or five different businesses and they come to me looking for a franchise. I'm like, well, why are you coming to me? You've done it before. Do it again. And they're like, I've done it before. I know how much of a pain in the butt that is, how much work that is. I don't want to go through that work again. I just want to step into a business in the box and go for it. Well, and that's actually falling into that where you drew your inspiration from uh, kind of rich dad, poor dad, and, and, and led you to, uh, to bigger and better things. Oh, it did, William. When I was uh, when I was getting my master's degree in business on that, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, and uh, and yeah, he ruined my corporate career for me uh, in a good way uh, on that one. But I realized that you know there are things that are better out there. And you know, while I was being an engineer and going through uh, business school, at the same time, uh, one of the my other fellow engineers and myself, we purchased the dry cleaners privately owned. We purchased uh, storage units, and then I had a few rental properties, so I was doing all that on the side. Uh, you know. So I was always really kind of thinking about things I could do for myself. But once I read Rich Dad Poor Dad's book, I realized that if I really wanted to go out there and I really wanted to get these things done, it was really time to just, you know, take a step away from that corporate career altogether and really bet on myself, take a risk on myself. My risk was, you know, betting on myself and that I could do it. And Rich Dad's Poor Dad, he really uh, just opened my mind to it and said, you know, it's now or never. You're either going to do it now. And I was 49, almost 50 years old at the time. So my dream was to get out of the corporate world by 50. And I said, great timing on the book there, uh, Robert Kiyosaki. I'm glad I read that. And let's make that step. So I took off and my partner actually took off from the corporate world at the same time. So I sold all my uh, uh, half of everything to, back to him. He took over those businesses. And I said, I got to get into that franchising thing and haven't looked back since. Um, and you also help people turn their business into a franchise, how, how, how do you go about that? Well, that's correct, William. So when people want to go out there and they want to grow, you can grow by yourself using your money, building out your locations little by little. That's uh, more linear growth on that. If you want to grow exponentially where you're growing a little bit faster, then you get into the world of franchising where other people are using their money to build out the locations. They're the local owner operators in the area. You don't get all the profits, but then you don't put all your money into building out those locations. So generally speaking, franchises charge about five or 10% royalties, and that'll be your income stream that you're gonna get helping those people out. If you're thinking about becoming or turning your business into a franchise, there are three things that we take a look at there that will make your your business more appealing uh, to, to people that I come in contact with that are looking to get into a franchise. Now, these three aren't set in stone. Uh, we've done it without them, but they, they certainly do help. One is generally speaking, if you were netting $100,000 or more, uh, that's a good plus on your business. It's a, a good sign. That's what people are looking for. It's a good solid six-figure income. Uh, two, if your service or business uh, can be used in just about every city and state in the U.S., that opens you up to more people uh, that will be interested in your franchise system. Now, there are franchises that rent boats out there. Obviously, you're not going to get a boat rental franchise, you know, in some parts of Arizona where there's no water or New Mexico. Uh, but there's enough cities and states it's out there where you do have a good pull of people on there. And so the third thing is, I would say, William, is that 
If you actually repeated it, if you actually built out another location or two or three locations, that's a good solid plus as well, because now you've shown people that you can reproduce it and you can bring in the money. So that's the three things on that is that 100,000 or more net uh, business or service can be used in as many different cities and states as possible. And if you've repeated it uh, two or three times, that's an added plus as well. Again, not set in stone for all of those, but they certainly help attract more people to your to your business or franchise. And uh, for for the okay, and that's for building your franchise out of a business or mm -hmm. a business idea. Um, say this: you got this young entrepreneur; they want to get into a franchise. How, how, what are the steps for them to become a franchise owner itself? First step is to reach out to me and we have a phone call. So our first call, how I work with them, William, is that our first call is that you'll ask me anything you want about me and about franchising itself. So I want to get you familiar with me, making sure that you're okay with working with me for one, that we get along. That's always a good first start on there. I also want to make sure that your expectations of what the franchise can do for you are realistic as well on that. But you'll get to know me. After that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you out an email with a questionnaire to fill out. You'll get that questionnaire filled out. It'll ask you just some, you know, to brag about yourself, some background information. I'll send you out a matrix of business types, show you the different types of franchise businesses that are possible out there for you. Kind of get the creative juices flowing on your end. And also our due diligence process where you and I will go through to not only find franchises that are a good fit, but then investigate those franchises together as well. So on our next call, we'll go through the questionnaire. We'll go through the matrix of business types. I'll ask you lots more questions at this point in time. William, I'm really getting to know you. You know, where have you been? So what do you bring to the table? What are your skill sets? Where are you at now? Are you looking to get into a franchise full time? Do you want one that's semi absentee? Uh, what kind of time uh, do you have during the day to run that business? Uh, what are you comfortable investing in a franchise? Not necessarily what you have, but what are you really comfortable investing in a franchise? And then where do you want to be? Where do you see that franchise taking you in the future? Where do you want to be with that franchise? And I put all that information that I gathered together and then I go out and I get to know the franchises pretty well. And I work with probably a little over 500 different franchises. I don't know every single one of them yeah, in depth, but within each industry, I've got probably three or four different franchises, uh, three, four or five different franchises that I know are real good. So I'll look to see who's available in your area, uh, making sure the demographics fit. And I know who the franchisors are looking for in a uh, potential franchisee. So on that part, I know, and then I just have to know what you're looking for. And I'm kind of like a match.com and realtor.com all rolled into one. And then what I do then is send out five or 10 different opportunities to my clients, give them a chance to look them over. We get back on the phone, go through those, narrow it down to two or three that you are looking at and say, all things being equal, you know, I can picture myself doing something like that. And then we run through the process of investigating them and determining if franchising is right for you to begin with. And if it is, then which franchise is right for you? Uh, and coming through your book, uh, there's a section there of uh, the mistakes to avoid, seven mistakes to avoid, I believe, in selecting a franchise. Mm -hmm. uh, would you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, there's a few different things on there that you can go through. We'll just go through a couple of them here real quick. Uh, one, the biggest one is what don't let what's in fashion cloud your judgment at this time. So just because it's popular now, just because it's going strong now, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to continue to do so in the future. Get to know that business model. Where are they making their money? How are they making their money? Where are they going to go with that in the future? You know, do you see that taking you somewhere in the future? So that's one on that one, because there's a lot of things that have you know built up that have been just, you know, huge. And then they, they bombed uh, in a few years. We don't want that. Uh, take, it, take advantage of free services that are offered out there when investigating a business. The one that I use and the one that I recommend is the local score chapter, S-C-O-R-E. I went through the different franchises I was looking at with those folks and they're local business people that have been in your area for quite some time and have owned businesses in your area. Good people to run some ideas by and they had some good ideas for me what to take a look at. Um, the other one I would say is, um, you know, check into funding. Uh, two different ways to fund your business is use your money or use other people's money. Using your money, 401k rollover, IRA rollover into a self-directed fund, you're not going into debt, but you are using your retirement money. So you got to be comfortable with that. And the other one is, of course, other people's money. Most of my investors like using other people's money. As long as the investment services, the debt, uh, then you're good to go. Uh, usually some pretty good rates on that. 
I went with not going into debt and using my 401k money. That was just a personal decision on my part to do that. Uh, and the last one that, uh, so we don't go too far into these, I would say is that when you are investing a, investigating a franchise, always talk with as many franchisees as possible so that you get a good feel for that business. You want to keep talking to as many of them as you can until you start hearing the same thing over and over again. Hopefully good. If not, move on on that. But franchisees I find are, are generally uh, really good people, perfectly blunt, uh, will we'll let you know good, bad, and otherwise. And there are also people that are going to help you grow your business because in general, I would say 90, 95% of the franchises have protected territories. So franchisees aren't competing with each other. So these are also be your friends. It's going to help you grow your business along with the franchisor. As a follow up to that, um, this is good. Investigating a franchise. What, what should I do if I've decided, you know, I'm a novice. I've never been involved in franchising. I'm coming out of the corporate world. What should I be asking? What should I be doing? What little steps I should be taking before uh, making a decision to move forward with a concept? Yeah, great question. Uh, when I actually send out a list of questions to my people uh, when I'm going through them, a list of questions for the franchise or send the franchisees. So things to take a look at. Uh, the first one, or first couple of them, I would say are the most important ones is what kind of a time commitment are they requiring from you? Make certain that if you were going to keep your day job or keep your other business, that they uh, allow semi-absentee ownership. And we de define semi-absentee ownership as 10 to 15 hours a week. Now, if they do allow semi-absentee ownership uh, and you know, you're thinking 10 to 15 hours a week, Another good reason to talk to the franchisees, especially the ones who started this semi-absentee and find out what the semi-absentee really mean. Does it really mean 10 to 15 hours a week or not? Find that out, uh, first of all. Uh, find out what the total investment is and their net worth requirements. Okay? Each franchise should have, uh, for the most part, a net worth requirement. On there, some of the lower uh, cost ones where you work from home um, won't necessarily need it because it's not a huge investment, but some of the other ones do. Make certain that you fall in uh, within their net worth requirements. Generally speaking, any good franchise, if you show them your net worth and it's not what they require, they'll just say, no, thank you, because they don't want you to run out of money. So those are a couple of things to start off with right away on there. The other things as you're going through there, get to know their culture, get to know them, and making certain that it fits with you and your culture on that and what, what you're looking for in a franchise. If there are certain things that you want to look for if you're looking at a brick and mortar. What kind of a grand opening do they offer for there? Everybody's going to offer uh, or should offer some really great training. And you'll ask the franchisees how the training is. So everybody should have great training. That should be a, uh, an easy one on that. The other one is grand opening for your brick and mortar franchises on there. If it's a, uh, if it's a model where they sign people up ahead of time, uh, you know, what kind of advertising marketing are they going to do uh, to sign people up ahead of time, like fitness type franchises. And there you want as many members as you can before you you do the you open up so that you've got a whole list of people going there. So check for that sort of thing. If it's a if it's a service type industry franchise and you don't want to be answering the phone all the time, then you want to check and see what kind of call centers do they have on there, and what does a call center do? Is it just uh, fielding the calls and setting appointments? Or are they going to do any kind of um, you know quotes over the phone, describing services on that? These are little things that, that you may not think of uh, right away. Again, I'll have the questions for you uh, when we work together. But these are the things that you need to look at uh, as well as you're investigating that franchise. And it's funny because you always talk about due diligence um, and FDD review. However, if you look at most FDDs in, in, in the franchise industry today for whatever reason that the lawyers are pitting it, protecting and, and being overprotective maybe, uh, but they're usually, you know, 40, 50, 60 pages. Uh, and I know that few people, few people will devote, you know, dive into that and, and read the entire uh, script. Uh, is there particular areas or particular areas in the FDD that I should just focus on? Well, we from, from, from a legal standpoint, I would say you should focus on getting yourself a franchise attorney and having them go over the franchise disclosure documents uh, with you. So I don't give legal advice or anything like that. For that, so that's what I tell everybody. Always have a franchise attorney. Okay, there's not a lot that can be changed in the franchise agreements or the franchise, or especially the franchise disclosure documents. But the franchise attorney will see if there's anything out of place, unusual in there because they've done it quite often. So they'll uh, alert you to that. On that, uh, for the most part, what they're going to do is they're going to let you know what you're getting yourself into, making sure you're okay with that. From a non-legal standpoint, William, not giving out legal advice. 
there are a few certain areas in there that I like to take a look at. One, take a look at item number seven, which is the total investment on there, and check and see who you're going to be paying money to and when. It's going to be a range. Keep in mind, they're not good. In the FDD, they're not going to have a specific number for a total investment because it's going to vary. If you open your franchise over here in Licking, Missouri, where I'm at, it's going to be pretty darn cheap because the cost of living is pretty low. If you open up in New York City, you're going to be your costs are going to be a little bit higher. Keep that in mind. That's where those variables come in. What one thing that everybody wants to know, of course, is how much money can I make? And that you'll find in the item number 19 under the um, financial disclosures on there. Most franchises will have that in there. It's not required, but most franchises will have that in there. That'll give you a good general idea of where the franchisees are at making money. Again, you will follow up with them when you talk to the franchisees to find out what they're making. Uh, and keep in mind that as you talk to those franchisees and you're asking how much they make, they've all been in your position at one point in time. So they've asked the same questions. Everybody wants to know that. You got to feel good about it, but the numbers got to make sense. The other one is item number 20, speaking of franchisees, that will give you the number of franchisees who are currently running the franchise, and then the number of franchisees who started running the franchise, but then are no longer running it. So it's pretty easy math to get a success rate. We like to see 85, 90% or better on that for the success rate, because that tells you how uh, how well the franchise does at picking out uh, a great franchisees that are going to keep running with the business. Now, there's many reasons why people uh, may may fail in the business. When I looked at my franchise, I in the case, the franchise is not going to necessarily keep track of the ones that left the franchise system. So you'll have to track those down yourself if you want to call them. But I did. I tracked down a few of those and I found out that, you know, the business partner had uh, jumped ship on them. So they, they didn't have the time to do it. So, you know, they had to close down the franchise. I uh, had a uh, a couple that, you know, one of the spouses got a job in another city, so they left and they couldn't run the franchise. Uh, and then another one turned it over to a um, a family member who wasn't vetted out by the franchise and they didn't do so well on it. So there's going to be many reasons if you can find out about that. But those are some of the areas. Uh, the other two areas I would say is look for uh, any bankruptcies that are listed in there. Probably not a good sign if they've bankrupted other businesses that they've had. Not necessarily bad, but not real good. Uh, litigation, if there's litigation, it's going to be in there. Uh, once you get up to a thousand franchisees or more, you're probably going to have uh, some litigation in your franchise. There's inevitably, inevitably going to be somebody who's upset uh, and going to, uh, in our litigious society, we'll want to sue somebody for it. But find out how they were resolved, if they are on that and what the franchise did about it. So those are just come up from a non-legal standpoint, not giving legal advice, but those are some of the little areas that I generally tech, like to take a look at. Um, well, finally, uh, I know you've put hundreds of people uh, taking into the direction of buying and acquiring a franchise. Is there any specific story that comes to mind of how you have helped um a franchisee built his wealth and, and uh, acquired some freedom. Yeah, they had, uh, let's see, back when uh, uh, Supercuts a while back, they had a bunch of corporate locations that they were selling on that. Um, and that was a big, uh, that was a busy, busy time for us because, you know, Supercuts had a couple thousand corporate locations. Well, I had a doctor in there. He wanted to get, he wanted to uh, supply uh, medical services to underprivileged people and he wanted to do it through uh, his investments. So we started off with about, 20 different supercuts for him. And I think he ended up getting close to about 100 different supercuts that he used then uh, that money for helping underprivileged people uh, uh, get medical services on that. Uh, that was a that was a huge plus. Uh, recently, I had a husband and wife team where he was looking for a semi-absentee business. Uh, so we, we were looking at electrical service businesses. She handled the kids and she handled the rental properties. And she was just kind of on the side. She had some good questions, but on the side most of the time. And um, so he was he was going to run a semi-absentee. And it ended up at the very end, she just stood up and, and after getting to know the business, she says, we don't need to run this semi-absentee. I can do that. I, I, that's nothing to that. I can do it. And uh, she ended up being rookie of the year, uh, her first year doing it. Uh, so that was really, really nice to see. And then I've had people come back to me after three years and say, well, I built it up. Uh, done what I wanted to do. Let's sell it off and let's go find me something else. It's like, right on, we can do that. So uh, yeah, it's always good hearing stories like that, William. Uh, it's, always, from my people. It's, it's always a pleasure to, to, to hear, you know, the successful stories because franchising is still 
uh, one of the best ways to uh, to grow and build your wealth and, and, and grow a business and help it, help other people as well. Um, I I really like to thank you for your time, Greg, this morning. Uh, it's a real pleasure catching up with you. And um, just from seeing a little wagging of the tail back there, I think someone's interested in going for a little walk, maybe. So you know, it's, it's funny how dogs can tell time. We usually go for a walk every day at uh, uh, at around this time, and so when, it's, it's kind of funny. They're like, "Dad, we're awake now." That little tail's wagging. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time, Greg. I really appreciate it. Thank you, William. It's been a pleasure being here, sir. Thanks for joining us today, and hope you have gained some valuable insights into the world of franchising. My name is William Lesante, and I would like to invite you to the next episode of the Franchise Coach Podcast. Please make sure to like and subscribe and share with your network. Also, click the link below to learn more about Franchising with Action Coach. Thank you.